This is Robbie, a research scientist at Google, working on quantum algorithms and applications at Quantum AI Lab. He is also an IFHO gold medalist and postdoctoral researcher at the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing, part of UC Berkeley. Hey guys, uh, we're here with uh, Robbie. Robbie, do you want to introduce yourself maybe a bit? Hi everyone, I'm, uh, I'm Robbie King. I'm a researcher in quantum computing. I work on quantum algorithms and uh, I'm currently based at Google Quantum AI and also at Simons Institute in UC Berkeley. Yeah, and Robbie's very modest, so I'll just fill in the blanks for you guys. Um, Robbie did a PhD at Caltech That's um, right. under yeah. John Preskill. Yep. Uh, who is one of the fi founding pioneers of quantum computing. So uh, when I was studying quantum computing uh, with, with, with Robbie actually at Cambridge, um, his book was like one of the recommended books that we read for our course. Uh, and Robbie also has a gold medal at the International Physics Olympiad. Right? Yep, so, that's true. Very, very modest person. Uh, let's jump right into it, Robbie. So um, quantum computing is like everywhere um, in, in the media right now, right? Like quantum computing stocks are going up. Um, there was obviously that release from Google yesterday, uh, which is very promising. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what do you think about the publicly traded quantum computing companies? So we have IonQ, we have Rigetti. Um, what, 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 what's going on with them? They've been public for a while. Um, what, what, what are their products maybe and uh, why are they so important? Right, so um, to be honest, I don't really know what their products are right now. It's kind of hard to figure it out. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess they're being traded just based on the, on the public opinion of the, of the potential for the field. Um, for example, like I don't think uh, they really have um, revenue that is is truly providing value yet. But you know, who knows about about well, soon like, in the future? Is there progress? Let's say is there like um, <clears throat> you know? The, the, I guess what's really interesting about quantum computing is the end goal is like so lofty that even if there's some progress, people are interested. That's right, and there is progress. Mm -hmm. So we are making really strong progress on the hardware side, mm -hmm. where um, you know. Uh, that the field is demonstrating new capabilities towards error-corrected quantum computers. And um, there's also a lot of progress on the algorithmic side, figuring out what we can do, uh, how we can apply these computers in the future when we have them. Um, so yeah, under, under all of this, there is a very sort of uh, strong sort of exponential, you could say, on the, on the technology side. Okay, so let's, let's talk more about the algorithms. I know that's what you work on. Um, you know, if we had, let's say, the perfect quantum computer, the kind of stuff that you read about in the textbooks, um, you know, we, we know about Shaw's algorithm, um, we know that um, modern day cryptography, RSA um, cryptography could be cracked. Um, what, what are some other algorithms that are coming out that are interesting that solve these like classically intractable computer science problems or physics problems? Right, so um, a lot of the algorithms work. Um, yes, yeah, so of course, you mentioned Shaw's algorithm. That was sort of the founding mm -hmm. algorithm of our field because it really demonstrated that quantum computers can do things that are definitely beyond the capabilities of classical computers. And also, Shaw's algorithm comes with um, a bunch of implications yeah. based on cryptography. So it's uh, really sort of um, you know, uh, it motivated the, the whole field early on. Um, but then more recently, people have been working a lot on these algorithms that can simulate nature basically. So mm -hmm. you, you can simulate a chemical molecule or a condensed matter physics system or material or something like this um, on a quantum computer and you can maybe uh, help use that to potentially help you design new uh, molecules or materials or drugs, things like that. So a lot of the, um, there's a whole sort of branch of the field working on that. Um, and that's what the announcement yesterday was about, right? It was a, that's a, right. a so constant that's, uh, in condensed matter physics. Well, so. the announcement yesterday was actually run on the physical device. So it's the okay. first example of a physics problem that was solved uh, where the answer is like compute some number, like 2.3 or something. So okay. um, it was the first example of that that was actually implemented on a device, cool. on a real quantum computer. Nice, nice. Um, but then we're also working on far future algorithms that we can't run until we have the device. And then I'll also say we're making progress also on like our other types of algorithms. For example, just published in Nature yesterday was an algorithm that um, I was sort of uh, involved in, which is this thing called decoded quantum interferometry, wow. which is a, a new Big word. <laughs> yeah, long name, but it's a it's a new quantum algorithm that seems to also solve a uh, a problem based on uh, polynomials 
that seems to be beyond the capabilities of classical computers. So that's not okay. to do with common simulation, okay. and it's not to do with Shor's algorithm. It's actually just a, a new thing. So that's okay. a nice also. Sounds like a nice pure maths problem, basically, rather than like a, a physics problem, I guess. Yeah, I was, you know, hopefully there'll be some uh, applications, but at the moment it's like uh, finding the best polynomial yeah, to do something. Okay. So, yeah. Very cool, yeah. I mean, like, that's always kind of, I think, you know, so I have a bit of background, obviously, in quantum computing, but I think you know, for the rest of our readers out there, if you kind of imagine, you know, there's that phrase that Richard Joshua, um, who's also one of the founding fathers of quantum computing, and he taught our first course, said right at the beginning of the course, which is there's no information without representation, right? That's so right. If uh, ultimately information processing is just all about physics, mm -hmm. right? And um, if you want to do computation, you have to take a physical system and manipulate it. Mm -hmm. And the real world is not Newto Newtonian. It's not a classical like mm -hmm. physical system. It's a quantum system. Mm -hmm. So if you want to solve like quantum physics problems, you should use a quantum computer. Is that like basically the gist of what a lot of these? That's right. Are? You said it better than uh, better than I could. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So I, d I don't want to take anything away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, nice. So yeah, we we talked a bit about the algorithms. Let's talk about kind of. The hardware side, obviously, that's where a lot of the bottlenecks are right now. We have a lot of cool ideas, but right. it's hard to um, produce anything useful from them. Um, who, who are the leaders in kind of producing uh, the fault tolerant quantum computer, let's say, and what, what are the different approaches? So, we've heard about superconducting qubits, right. topological. What, what, what are the approaches? Right, so uh, superconducting qubits actually just won the Nobel Prize. I don't know if you, you guys saw that, but um, yeah, so uh, three scientists it was Michelle Deveray. John Martinez and John Clark, they uh -huh. won the Nobel Prize for uh, work they did in the 80s that really set the sort of um, stage for quantum computers to be built using these superconducting uh, qubits. So, so that's that's one approach, and that's the approach that... Can uh, just explain, like, in layman terms, like, what, what what's the, the physics behind it? Yeah, so it's... Um, my understanding is that it's, like, a, a small circuit that's, like, made of some superconducting um, metal or something, and um, then so the collective motion of the electrons um, is, becomes quantized when you cool it down to very low temperatures and that, that forms your qubit. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, so this is the approach that's being taken by Google and IBM and also a lot of uh, academic labs. And so that's sort of one approach. Um, there's another approach that got a lot of attention recently based on these things called uh, neutral atoms. So um, there was some work done at Harvard that was quite exciting on this. and. Um, Lots of academic labs are being set up, and a few startups as well. So, um, yeah, that's another one to watch. I would say. Okay, amazing. And like, you know, a, 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 what what's really interesting about quantum computing is like there's equal push from like the academic side and kind of the commercial side, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and that's really interesting. So you're in California, kind of um, startup companies, venture backed companies, and uh, academic institutions just work hand in hand to kind of push the boundaries of science. That's um, right. Yeah. When when you when you start thinking about sort of the returns available to these investors, the commercial applications, um, how far away do you think we are from like the first like actual groundbreaking commercial applications of a quantum computer? It's a really hard question. I know, yeah, in year, in years, you mean or? Yeah, in years, <laughs> years. Um, uh, I would say, okay, my honest answer is we really don't know. Uh -huh. um, I would say it will be at least five years. Okay. Um, but these things are very hard to predict, and it, it's hard to predict because. Research is just sort of, uh, by its, its nature, you don't know what you're going to find. Yeah. So, um, you know, I do think something very um, sort of, uh, I do think there will be miracles that will come out of this, yeah. this direction um, of technology. But uh, I can't tell you what they'll be because yeah. then they wouldn't be sort of discoveries of miracles. If, if, um, so it. I don't know when these will happen, but I guess in terms of Shaw's algorithm, that, you know, that will definitely have impact. But will maybe be like 10 plus years. Okay, got you. It's, yeah. it's very breakthrough driven, I guess. It's like similar with AI, right? Like there was concrete steps, you know, we, we had like GPT-3 came out and then, you know, kind of the, the chain of reasoning models came out. Who knows what's next? Until then you have this like very kind of vanilla growth and then you're relying on something like crazy to happen to basically achieve the next. That's right. Lot, and, and I think, you know, I hope that this will come and then at that point there'll be, there'll be no going back, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic. Um, Okay, fantastic. Uh, who do you think are like the current leaders in in quantum computing, uh, both from the academia and the, the the commercial side? Who's who's doing the best job at pushing the boundaries? Um, right, who's, who's, the, who's, who's to watch out for, basically? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of strong strong players. So I guess uh, uh, Google is is um, where I work is mm -hmm. is one of the strongest. I would say. 
Um, there's also IBM and also Microsoft and Amazon have, have efforts as well. And then there's a bunch of startups, for example, like uh, we were talking about the ones that are publicly traded, but then there's also um, more sort of um, uh, stealthy ones like, uh, you know, PsyQuantum, QERA, yeah. Pascal, these sorts of places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and then in terms of the academic side, you could, I think uh, there's a lot of places that are doing good work. I mean, I, I'm more familiar with the the algorithm side. So I, I guess, uh, you know, Caltech, where I did my PhD, is very mm -hmm. strong. And then there's another strong group at, in UC Berkeley um, mm -hmm. called the Simons Institute. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the Caltech lab is led by, by John Preskill. And then there's uh, Umesh Bazarani is the person in charge of the Simons lab. And then MIT is very strong and Harvard and um, lots of other places as well. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like as usual, most of the innovation is happening in the US. Maybe that's why you left. Uh, uh, after Cambridge to go there, right? It does feel that way. I hope that, you know, it's, it becomes more, um, it does feel that a lot of the um, investment and the talent is right now more weighted towards the US, um, I would say, yeah. Makes sense. Um, let's switch tack slightly. So mm -hmm. we've talked about kind of um, you know, these, these hypothetical problems or even like real problems around um, kind of number theory, physics that are kind of being solved by uh, quantum computing. One thing we haven't touched on is obviously rise of kind of um, these new machine learning models that kind of create artificially intelligent systems, right? So uh, I remember back when I was at Cambridge, there was a few lectures uh, Richard gave on, uh, or Professor Joshua gave on um, quantum machine learning and like how we can design algorithms that make some of the tasks, um, some of the computationally intensive tasks when you kind of train a, a large um, machine learning model uh, much simpler and much faster. Mm. Uh, does quantum computing have the ability to make um, you know, model training or model inference much simpler and much cheaper? I would say that we don't know how to do that right okay. now. So I think if you are seeing that in uh -huh. places, I would say that um, we don't have uh, an understanding of how to use quantum computers to, to help, a concrete understanding of how to help it with machine learning. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, it would be great, but uh, we, haven't, we haven't figured out such a thing. That's good. Yes. Very refreshing so, to hear, like, an uh, yeah. opinion of someone who knows knows what they're talking about, as opposed to kind of the, the media. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's the thing that everyone is thinking about. So it's mm -hmm. like, okay, can we use quantum computers to, like, uh, reduce the energy consumption of AI yeah, or something? Indeed. Just because it's the problem that sort of everyone is it's thinking about. Is yeah, thinking about. But um, uh, I kind of hope that it will be actually that the application will be sort of new and, mm -hmm. and something that we can't even imagine today. So, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's definitely the case. I mean, we see a lot of times like hardware brings unlocks in different areas of science that right. people don't even think about because it always, so, so much of science is done with the constraints of what's physically computable at that right. point, right? right. Um, yeah, there's lots of examples of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, um, yeah, let's talk more about, oh, I had a really good question in my mind. I just forgot about it. By the way, on the, you know, you mentioned the US versus uh, the rest of the world. There are some actually, I mean, we're in the UK right now in London, yeah. so there are some very strong startups in the, U in the UK that I can mention. For example, there is um, uh, Phasecraft, which is a mm -hmm. startup yeah. based in yeah. London that is working on, um, on algorithms, so yeah. they're, they're trying to actually really make these things useful soon. Um, and then there's also Riverlane, Riverlane yeah. which is another startup that is uh, currently focusing on um, the the error correction yeah. aspect of quantum hardware. So, yeah, yeah Riverlane is Cambridge based, right? We, uh, yeah, that's true. Actually, their offices in, in Cambridge. Cambridge right? yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's true. Um, amazing. So we talked a bit about error correction, right? Or oh, you mentioned it like very briefly, I think. Um, so people kind of aware that unlike a, so you know, the, you, we're talking about qubits, right? Qubits are just a quantum analog of transistors um, at the end of the day, and transistors are just this like um, physical classical system that um, encodes a zero or a one, mm -hmm. um, is able to like pass that signal on. Um, and transistors don't need, they, transistors are generally kind of, kind of error proof. So you talked about error correction before. Can you kind of explain what error correction or fault tolerance is in the, in the context of like quantum hardware and like what is, what, what's the significance of it? Why do qubits need error correction and why is error correction so important? Um, right, so um, my understanding is actually that we used error correction for classical computers uh, you know, early on, yeah. but then transistors became so good yeah. that we basically don't need to do it anymore yeah, and right. we sort of forgot about it. Um, but for quantum computing, it's really essential and the reason is sort of fundamental 
The reason is that um, if you have a, a, a qubit, a quantum system, it will be quantum as long as it's sort of perfectly isolated. But then also we're trying to make a computer, so we're trying to program these things. So we're mm -hmm. trying to yeah. control them, yeah. which means they can't be perfectly isolated, mm -hmm. otherwise we wouldn't be able to program them. So mm -hmm. that's a sort of um, fundamental uh, difficulty that will introduce some amount of error. And then so to get reliable computation, you need to sort of correct that error. And then it was a really sort of deep discovery in, in physics in the, in the sort of 90s and 2000s that this is actually possible to do with quantum information. So it's possible to take many um, noisy qubits and have a, um, uh, an error correcting code that, that builds out of them a single very um, high quality logical qubit. Yeah, so, so physical qubits and logical qubits, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. Okay. So there'll be some sort of like a 50 to 1. Okay. Uh, okay. These error corrections, are they, are they like a classical step? Or are they also like a quantum? No, it's you need to do something on the. You need to like measure these um, uh -huh. what's called syndromes, and you need to decode them, and okay. then go back and correct the errors. And, and um, I guess uh, you know an analogy would be like in, in classical. Uh, suppose you're sending a um, piece of information, yeah. and you know over a noisy channel. Over a noisy like, channel, yeah, and then it. so I'm on the phone to you. It's like. Okay. If I say yes three times, yeah. you're more likely to hear the yes than just one time. So it's sort of a, that kind of. Well, so there's like quantum analogs to like Hamming codes and stuff that you have. In exactly, exactly. In classical information exactly. theory. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Um, I guess like last main question. Um, a lot of our users are going to be interested in um, crypto, uh, specifically cryptographic protocols, how they link to uh, blockchain technologies and, and cryptocurrencies. Um, we know about Shor's algorithm. Shor's algorithm is, uh, for people not familiar, is just a um, very efficient quantum algorithm that can break um, most of the, uh, well, actually, but pretty, pretty much all of the online uh, encryption protocols that we have, things that keep your credit card information safe and so on. Um, does the advent of quantum computers uh, cause any kind of danger to cryptographic protocols? Could we see blockchains um, breaking as attacks become easier? Right. So, um yeah, it is true that these things are encrypted ba based on crypto systems that Shor's algorithm, in principle, could um, could break. Yeah, so I think uh, yeah, it's something to it's worth looking at. But I guess uh, a question to throw back at you, maybe uh, as a as an expert on the finance uh -huh. side, what do you think would happen if this was the case? If there was a quantum computer that could um, that could crack one of these cryptocurrencies, like with the with the price tank, or would there be a switch to some sort of yeah new... indeed so I, I guess like um, most of these uh, protocols are just like decentralized ledgers right that um, indicate the balances and positions that everyone have in the coin so if it's possible to attack them by some vector then um, the trust in the currency erodes I guess and because the, the history of the ledger can be rewritten so it's like you know um, I give you a 10 pound note uh, but then it becomes really easy to scam to uh, um, fraudulently create copies of those ten pounds notes, and you can't tell the difference between them. Mm -hmm. What right. happened then is like anyone who has a ten pound note that's not no, no longer trustworthy, and therefore their value of their note basically goes to zero. Uh -huh. so, so you think the value of, of uh, a lot of Bitcoin, Bitcoin yeah, yeah, will yeah, go to yeah. zero? Um, oh. Yeah, if, if if it could be cracked using new quantum technologies, yeah, definitely that would be like the logical conclusion. Or what's more likely is they they would produce. Um, well, you, you would hope that before then they would produce um, some new protocol uh, which could not be cracked by quantum uh, quantum methods or right. had, uh, some other things, and then they would kind of fork. They would fork, fork the blockchain, the blockchain. and exactly. use a new system. Yeah, exactly. So we've seen in, in, in most blockchains like Ethereum, Bitcoin, um, well, Ethereum, there, there have been hard forks before, and uh, typically what happens is people just take the new uh, fork, and then that becomes the new de facto standard and the old one. You still have that, but because it's trusted error, it's bad. It's like real world value basically goes to zero. I see, but is there some sort of because it's decentralized? Would there be some sort of mechanism where not everybody agrees? So the, the it splits in half, and then like it's yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, so that that's what happened with like the Ethereum fork, I guess. Is uh, people still maintain the old version of Ethereum, um, uh -huh. but uh, because kind of the even though it's decentralized, obviously there's a lot of kind of mind share and uh, most of the smart development work and improvement protocols are going on, like the new chain, um, that's where people see most of the value. Mm. Right. Cool. Anything else we should ask? No. Excellent, man.